I've already been asked by a number of people next time I spoke, would I be speaking on Acts chapter 15? The answer is yes. I want to get through this as much as anybody does. And as we continue in the book of Acts, we come to one of the most controversial of all the chapters. In fact, many of the commentators feel this is by far the most controversial chapter in the entire New Testament, especially if only in Acts. It's the meeting of the council in Jerusalem. It is interpreted by modern Christianity as the definitive break with Judaism and the Mosaic law. The definitive break, this one chapter is cited as the Acts 15 break. We're gonna test this statement as it needs to be defined and defined in context. And objectively, we often answer questions, many of us in life will answer a question before we've heard the matter. So we're gonna try and make up our minds as uh, we think we, we know, but we're gonna try and understand a little more deeply. No one here is expected to check their brain at the door. In fact, just exactly the opposite, exactly the opposite, we seek the truth together. And we, when we don't know, guess what we say when we don't know? We don't know. Because if you say you know when you don't know, my mommy and daddy said that's a lie. So we're going to say we don't know when we don't know. So today, as we live in a, a type of Babylon, even more so, I think, in many ways than ancient Babylon, we're in Acts chapter 15 entitled The Council and the Yoke. Now, as a running start to Acts 15, Acts 14 finds the apostles, Paul and Barnabas, yes, both were apostles, both of them, Paul and Barnabas, are beaten in Iconium. And as usual, when they're beaten in one place, what do they do? Just move to the next town. And that's exactly what they do. They went to Antioch in Syria. Now, there's two Antiochs. So if you want to, in, in preparation for tonight and patterns of evidence, the most important of your, part of your Bible tonight is going to be in the maps. So if you want to go to your maps and you see where Jerusalem is and where Antioch, Syria is, this is the geography that we're talking about here. And there they met in Antioch, fellow believers, and taught them. And so in Acts 15, the scene, the people, and the events all change. They all change. I'm going to read chapter 15, verses 1 through 21, with very little comment so we get an idea of the gist of the chapter. And again, get the, the lay of the land, as it were. Verse 1, chapter 15. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small discussion and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. And they reported all the things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider the matter. And when they had heard much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth, the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe it. So God who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, and made no distinction between them and us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, but neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take, out a, to take out of them a people for his name. And with, it, with, the, and with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is, is written. After the cell will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble these among, from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. 
That is the gist. There's more, and we'll cover that. But I want you to get the running idea of the people, the places, and what exactly is going on. This is the most controversial chapter in the book of Acts, possibly the New Testament. But let's dig deeper. Let's again read it, the first five verses of Acts chapter 15. And certain men, verse 1, came down from Judea, down from Judea, and taught the brethren. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, this is repeated over and over and over again. When it says, I'm, this is just me, had no small dissension and dispute. I think it was probably pretty close to a brawl. No small dispute. That means no small means big. So they had a, a battle, a dissension and dispute. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria. And if you can look on your map, what we're talking about, they're going down from Antioch, but up to Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem is up on a hill, Antioch's lower. And so they're going up to Jerusalem. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. And they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up. There's a lot of up and down in this, these first few verses. Lots of up and lots of down. Saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. It starts, as most of these issues do, with a controversy. There is a dispute. There's differing opinions. Certain men from Judea, Judea is a large region. It's south of Antioch. What's interesting, it's south of Antioch, Syria. Does anybody have any idea on your map? Can you guess how many miles this is? It's between 270 and 300 miles. Yeah, there was no Amtrak. They either walked it or they took a boat or did both or they took a donkey, 300 miles. It was a two to three week trip. Try walking, to give an analogy, try walking from LA to the Arizona border. It's just about the same terrain. Oh, and you're going up. This was no small trek. Verse one is key. It says, according to the custom of Moses. That's an interesting phrase, the custom of Moses. If you're not circumcised to according to this custom, you have no salvation. If you don't have the one, you don't have the other. We're going to be talking a lot about circumcision. Not going to get too graphic, especially for the guys, because we can relate. We're going to talk about that as well. But if you're not circumcised, you have no salvation. So they had no small dis dissension. They argued. And then for two weeks, the text seems to say for the two to three week trip, they all went up to Jerusalem. It must have been a wonderful trip. Just they're pa it's pa he's painting a picture, arguing with somebody for two to three weeks. I'm sure they kept, both sides kept silent, never discussed it. It's interesting. It says that they, while they were going up, they went through Phoenicia and Samaria, verse three, describing the conversion of the Gentiles. So it almost seems... The implication is Paul and Barnabas are rubbing it in. If these, if these sects of the, Pharise the sects of the Pharisees was with them, they're just rubbing it in. Shall we tell you how the Gentiles received the gospel? Well, the other group with them didn't agree. They needed to be circumcised. So for two long weeks, they had to go to Jerusalem to resolve it. The apostles and the elders, they will decide. But the word custom is intriguing. Custom. We have customs. We have lots of customs. And that may be part of the cause. It doesn't say Moses' law. It says Moses' custom. What's a custom? The Greek, you can look this up. It's so very easy. It is the word ethos. It's where we get the word ethic. The way you do, the do, the way you do things. Your custom. How does Luke use it in the New Testament, specifically in the book of Acts? It's quite interesting. The word custom is used frequently. In Acts chapter 6, if you'll turn there, please. Acts chapter 6. You'll remember we went through this. We're going to pick it up in verse 13. Acts chapter 6, verse 13. This is Stephen giving his defense before the Jewish authorities. In Acts 6, verse 13. He says, they, meaning the Sanhedrin, the council, they also set up false witnesses against Stephen, who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Verse 14, 
For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat on the council looking steadfastly at him, Stephen, saw his face as the face of an angel. They reported that he was going to change the custom of Moses. What word is missing there? The word law. Customs is used. Contrast this with the very end of the book. If you remember, Paul appears before Agrippa, King Agrippa. He uses the word custom. But I want to focus on Acts chapter 28, the very end of the book. Acts chapter 28, if you'll move there. If anybody gets there ahead of me, just start reading. Just joking. In Acts chapter 28, but pick it up in verse 17. This is a fascinating where Paul is in Rome. Paul is in chains. He's been arrested. Just picture this. He's standing in front of one person after another. And then in verse 17, it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to them, I mean, Paul, I'm sorry, maybe it's me. Paul is such a schmoozer. He, care, he chooses his words so carefully. Remember, he always knows his audience. He always remember who's he speaking in front of. And you can go back and study how he spoke to Agrippa. He says, men and brethren, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of the fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. I know I'm adding a little drama to it, but I can only imagine how he said it. I'm sure he didn't say it even worded. I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, wanted to let me go because there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I mean, who's he think he's speaking of, speaking to? When the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. Oh, no. For this reason, therefore, I've called, called for you to see you and speak with you. Because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. Imagine bound with this chain. He, I, I just picture it. He probably picks up his hands. He's in chains. So get this picture. And when they said to him, we neither received letters from Judea concerning you or any of the brethren who came or reported spoken any evil of you. But we desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. So Paul is very aware of the customs. And to date, and the, before the, the, uh, the leadership of Rome and of the Jews, he hasn't spoken against the customs. But he doesn't use the word law. He uses the word custom. He uses the word custom of our fathers. And here he has not spoken against it. He then uses later in this chapter, and you can read it. It's fascinating. We won't take the time. He uses the law and the prophets to prove that Jesus is the hope of Israel. So we can see how Luke uses this word custom as a tradition. We'll also see, we very easily see Paul's attitude toward God's law. He's innocent. Tradition makes you think of a movie years ago, Fiddler on the Roof. Remember that movie? I won't, I won't try and demonstrate what Tevye, how he said it. It's a song. We have traditions. There are good traditions and there are questionable traditions. We feel they're based in the Bible as do other people. Blessing the children after the feast is a tradition. It's a good tradition. We do, we feel we have uh, biblical grounds for it. In the past, all organizations have some traditions that they look back on in the, from the past. They say, uh, what were we thinking? That happens. But in this case, in verse one, tradition is a good translation for the word ethos. As Luke will prove, it could refer to the current oral law, which we know, and I've spoken of it before, as the Mishnah. This is the oral Torah. Now, it's in a book. Therefore, it was oral. Now it is written. But they still consider this, by definition, this is oral Torah. And it is very, very important. They have a tradition on the tradition on the tradition the Talmud has the Mishnah as a tradition. The Shulchan Aruch is a traditional interpretation of the Talmud. That's the code of Jewish law, where it's condensed again. It's a commentary on the commentary on the commentary of the oral traditions. 
And I think this is what he may be talking to. Let's review what the Mishnah is because it is so important in this chapter. So very important. It consists of six orders of seven to 12 tractates each, 83 sections in total in this book, 83. The washing of cups and saucers of hands that we read about in the New Testament. Why does Peter say, shall I forgive my, my brother three times? It comes from this. It was the oral traditions at the time yet to be written down by 200 CE, 200 AD. The oral law, even today for Orthodox Jews, is equal to the written Torah. It has full equality, as we'll see. They feel it was given to Moses at Sinai, along with the written law. It is that important. And the Christian community, and sometimes the Church of God community, completely missed the point of how important these documents are to the Jews. There are two different laws. They are considered equal, again, in all points to the written Torah. This Torah is equal to this Torah, is equal to this Torah. I know. This is equal to this. Think not. We'll do some, uh, we'll do some analysis. Mishnah Tractate Shabbat has detailed instructions of rituals, indeed, for circumcision. It talks about the day, the type, the scalpel, the words. We're going to go into it in a little bit. It's called the Brit Milah, the covenant of circumcision. Many of you know a moil is the person, the specific person used to circumcise Hebrew babies. David Stern in his Jewish New Testament commentary, one of the few commentaries that even bring this up. They make this clear, the rabbis do, by adding explicitly that the Gentile believers should be directed to observe the Torah of Moshe, unquote by which they mean both the written and oral Torah. When they say custom of Moses, they don't mean the Abrahamic covenant restated by Moses in, in the law. They mean this, this ritual, this tradition. So when you see the word Pharisee, because they were the one and only group that were single-handedly promoting the oral Torah. In the New Testament gospels, we could spend a whole session on Jesus's reference Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of He was speaking, I believe, very clearly of this. So when you see Pharisee in the word law or Moses' law, it might easily reflect this. Is circumcision required for salvation? That's what this debate's about. Well, in fact, yes, in many ways it is. It's in the law. Turn with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy where it speaks about circumcision. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, we're gonna pick it up in verse I think I got the right verse. And now, Israel, what does the eternal your God require of you but to fear the eternal your God, walk in his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the eternal your God and also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord, delighted only in, the, the Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all other peoples. He says, as it is this day, verse 16, therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who knows no partiality nor takes a bribe. Circumcision is of the heart. Let me ask you, this is a rhetorical question. What do you think is harder to perform? Circumcision physically or circumcision of the heart? The latter. It's kind of a guy question. In a lot of ways, I can see some guys wincing a little bit. It's pretty standard procedure in society for young boys to be circumcised. I can remember I'm, I was debating on whether to tell the story or not. I, I got to see, I'm not going to go into detail, I promise you that ahead of time. But I remember one of my grandsons, they said, would you like to be there when he's circumcised? It was the day of his birth. 
I said, we're not going to wait to the eighth day. And they said, what? I said, you forget it, it's okay. So we, we show up in the room and it was over before it started. All I remember, I think it was Ethan. Ethan looked at us and said, what are you doing to me? He said, can I get a glass of scotch before we do this? But it was, it was over so quickly. Done and done. Had a little anesthetic. Done and done. But it doesn't make us Jewish. We didn't have to listen to anyone tell us this is the rights and the regulations. Because the circumcision in the Mishnah tractates Shabbat chapters 9, chapter 18, chapter 19. Talk about circumcision. Pesachim chapter 3, Megillah chapter 2, Nedarim chapter 3, Arachim chapter 2, Kiratot 1, Negeim 7. All discuss the ritual of the customs of Moshe for circumcision. It is an ordeal. It is an ordeal. I have another question. After 3,500 years, allegedly, since the time of Abraham, of Hebrew baby boys being circumcised, how come they're not born circumcised? I guess evolution doesn't apply. It's still done today. But let's return to hearts. That's what Deuteronomy chapter 10 is talking about. It does not mean that the law is spiritualized away, anything but, but there is a spiritual component to the law. It's holy, just, and good. The concept of circumcised hearts is repeated over and over as a constant theme through both testaments. I'll, I'll, you can look these up. I'll give you the chapter. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 30, Jeremiah chapters 4 and 9, Ezekiel 44, Acts chapter 7, where it's included not only you circumcise your heart, your ears as well. And it might be surgically a little easier to get at, but it talks about the, the circumcision of both ears and hearts. Romans chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 3 and Galatians 5 and 6 all speak of circumcision of the heart. So is circumcision still required? Yes, it is. Over and over and over again. The heart is what we're going to find out is so important later as Peter speaks. But Deuteronomy also speaks about men and women being circumcised. Physical circumcision, let me explain to you, is only for men, not for females or self-identifying males. Physically impossible. It's only for men. But Deuteronomy, when we're talking about the circumcision of the heart and later in Acts, the ears, this is for men and women. This is for everyone no matter who or, or where they came from. So we have a dilemma somewhat. Does the written law have any validity? Turn with me, if you would, to Romans, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, all the way to the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to pick it up in verse uh, 17. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches, was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. I don't know how I'd even do that. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Verse 10, verse 19. Circumcision is nothing, but the uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is. The words, what matters is added. It is the commandments of God. That is what matters. Circumcision, circumcision is of the heart. It doesn't make any distinction whether you are or you are not. And it only applies to the men. So circumcision and commandments are just opposed, but there's more. They arrive in Jerusalem. We pick it up in Acts back to 15. We pick it up in verse 6. Now, when the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter, and when there had been much dispute, there's, there's that dispute again, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, those that God chose among us, that by my mouth, the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, 
acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us and made his distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Verse 8 and 9, they have been given the Holy Spirit just as with us. It's linked to the heart twice. Circumcision is of the heart. The Holy Spirit is what changes our hearts. Without it, there's no change. The Spirit is what guides and leads the Gentiles, the apostles, and you and me, all of us. It applies to all of us. He says, why do you test God by placing this particular yoke on anyone? Yoke. He also uses the word fathers. They were unable to bear it. Fathers? That's another very interesting key term. Back to our friend. I know you're tired of it, but we're not done with the oral law. In the oral law, the Mishnah has a tractate inside this book. It is Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers. Tractate of Odin, the sixth chapter says, Kenyan Torah, the acquisition of Torah. It's in the oral Torah. So it's talking about both the written and oral Torah. This yoke is another key phrase in the Mishnah, in the oral Torah. This word yoke, the phrase is found, is known as, sorry to throw this, this, this Hebrew at you. My Hebrew is so bad. It is known as Kabbalat Ol Mitzvot which means reception or acceptance of the yoke of the commandments. And the comment, Jewish commentary says, what does this entail as practical program? First, it necessitates acknowledgement of the authority of Torah. Got that? The first five books of Moses. Got that? And the oral interpretation of that law by the sages of the Talmud and the codes of the Jewish law. These two components are called the written Torah and the oral Torah and together they comprise the body of Jewish law. There is no distinction between the oral and the written. Let that sink in. So when he talks about this yoke, it's not just the written Torah, it's a yoke of the oral, all of the oral Torah that existed in the first century that Jesus spoke against over and over, the rites, the customs, the traditions, all of it. If the temple had existed after 70 AD, those ceremonies would still continue. He says this was impossible to bear. No kidding. This book, the Code of Jewish Law, the Kitzur Shulan Haruk, talks about when to pray, how to pray, what to say, how to wash, when to wash. And some of them are very good traditions. They're not all bad. They're great for historical understanding, but they are not for doctrine. They are hardly for doctrine because they are not law. They're maybe possibly, if anything, good, good uh, recommendations, but not much more than that. This was impossible to bear, and I believe this is exactly what Peter refers, because there is a yoke to bear. There's no two ways about it. There is a yoke that we are to bear. Turn with me if you would. Keep your hand in Acts, and we're going to move to back to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, we're going to pick it up in verse 27. Jesus says in verse 27, Matthew 11. All things have been delivered to me by my father, and no one knows the son except the father, nor does anyone know the father except the son, and the ones to whom the son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You have heard that over and over and over again. Jesus well knew, knew, knew very well the yoke of the oral tradition. He spoke against it. But there is another yoke, his yoke. What is fascinating about this is the word rest. He talks about giving people rest. 
he repeats it at least twice here. It is a cognate or a related word to what is used in Hebrews chapter 4, which references what? The Sabbath. The Sabbath rest. Jesus says in the next section, chapter 12 of Matthew, very famous, who is he Lord of, among so many other things? He's Lord of the Sabbath. The same word, anapausis. It's so related. He gives us rest. Who gave us the Ten Commandments on Sinai? I believe we're correct that we believe that Jesus was the giver of the law at Sinai. It's that important. These are his commandments that God gave to him. I reference you to John 15. We won't turn there. John 15, 9, and 9 through 10. John 15, 9 and 10. He talks about his father's commandments. We will read from 1 John, if you'll turn back there, please. 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter five and beginning in verse one, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him and who begot also loves him, who is begotten of him. By this, we know that we love, we have, we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. So what's burdensome? This is the yoke. Traditions of men that can never be born. You can't keep up with them. Well-intentioned. I don't mean to, to imply at all they weren't well-intentioned. But there is a different yoke, and indeed, that yoke Christ gives us is the yoke of commandments, but that burden is light, and they are joyful. It talks about the Sabbath. So when we think about this, he's talking about today, the Sabbath, as a representation, a part of that yoke. So there really, in many ways, are two different laws when you read the word laws in the New Testament. There's the law of God to Moses, and there's traditions of men posing as law. It is not. Peter is clear. He says, the Gentiles, by my voice, he said, and he's talking about Cornelius and his household in Acts chapter 10, the Holy Spirit came upon them. You'll notice circumcision isn't even involved. It's not even mentioned. In fact, they hadn't even been baptized, kind of. Acts 10 got a little out of order, right? Baptism of the Holy Spirit, then, then they got baptized. He says they were saved just as we were. Back to chapter 15 of Acts, where we pick up the story again. In Acts chapter 15, verse 12. This to me is so, so interesting. Chapter 15, verse 12. There is a lot here. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. They only get one verse. Paul, Peter got a whole lot more. And after they had become silent, James answered saying, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon, and it's interesting in verse 14, he uses his Hebrew name Shimeon. He doesn't call him Peter. He calls him Simon. Simon has declared how God at the first visit of the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, after this I'll return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins. I will set it up that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. This is from Amos, Amos chapter 9. What's interesting is that he talks about these issues. Simon is referenced by, by James. Remember, James is the more conservative, the more conservative. What's also interesting is he said, verse 18, known to God from all eternity are his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted to idols, sexual immorality, things strangled, and from blood. For Moses had, has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is referenced by Peter. This Amos 9 is all about grace. You didn't see the word law. You didn't see the word commandments. It's God's favor. And it, the, great, the concept of grace is so important from the standpoint from the standpoint, it's not a New Testament word. In the Old Testament, there are at least four or five different words that mean 
grace or favor that God bestows on mankind. And it's important. It's simply just not a New Testament word. What's important to understand that when people say it's grace versus law, for, you to, for someone to say there is no grace in the Old Testament, I, tr- I refer you to Malachi chapter 1, verse 9. We will not turn there. But the words are nuanced. In fact, one of the most famous translations of the word grace in the Old Testament is the word loving kindness. We have a hymn. It's Psalm 51. What's, it, what's the first line in it? In your loving kindness, be merciful to me. This is God's grace. James quotes from prophet, the prophet Amos in verse 9. The Gentiles who are called by my name. It is a consistent and repeated theme in the book of Acts. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord that is drawn to God and are turning to God. They're in the process of turning to God. They are just beginning to understand. What is asked of them, James says, because they know little to nothing of God and his law. Right? They're new. They're brand new. They don't know. They don't know. And we'll see these issues, these very issues, in Acts chapter 21 and 22 with some of the exact wording. Verse 20 picks up which a very, very set of uh, interesting set of issues that James lines out. These, four, these are four laws. Often you've heard of, how many of you have heard of the Noahide laws, the laws of Noah? There's not four Noahide laws, and I think it's a very weak representation of what's happening here. There's, there's, there's seven of them. Technically, there's seven. Oh, by the way, guess where the seven Noahide laws are mentioned? You get one guess. Yeah, the Mishnah and the Talmud. That's where these come from. I think it's, it's immaterial. All four of these issues come from the written law of God. Things from idols, food in particular, or, or physical things. Exodus chapter 34. Read Exodus chapter thir- 34. It's all there. No blood or strangled animal meat. It's repeated in Leviticus 3, Leviticus 7, Leviticus 17, and Genesis 9, 4 to Noah. It's all in the law. Sexual immorality, oh, that's not mentioned in God's law. It's in one of the commandments. It's throughout the Old Testament, Exodus 20, Leviticus 18. All four of these items are all centered on law. And these were issues for Gentiles because Gentiles in that era, in that area, prone to do these, all these four things. He said, just stay away from these things. What is fascinating is verse 21. He says in verse 21, for or because, for Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Now, that made me wonder. So what I did was, I, we have a synagogue in the city where I live. I went online and checked them out. You'll never believe this. Guess what day they worship on? Shakaru. It's Saturday. What does, what does James say? For Moses has had throughout many generations, those who preach him in every city, notice the, the all-encompassing, every city, many generations, in the synagogues every Sabbath. Now, how are you going to hear Moses in the synagogue? On what day? On what day? On Sabbath, every week. The Gentiles would hear not only the written law of Moses on Sabbath, they more than likely, because if they were believing, they would hear about Jesus Christ as well on the Sabbath. The overriding issue here, what's the point? They'll hear the law and the prophets. James just quoted the prophets. James just quoted Amos. That's also read in the synagogue. By the way, we talk about it. How many Sabbaths? Every Sabbath. More times than not, we will speak from both the Old and the New Testaments. The law, we've already covered the law, the prophets, and the New Testament in this message alone. We do it even in our hymns. He says, James, who is very pro-Torah, he's very clear. For now, give these people a break. Lighten up. Give them time to learn. They've called on God's name and he has accepted them just as with us. Again, just as with me and you. Don't back the truck up on them. Don't dump 15 booklets. No, I shouldn't have said booklets. Don't back up 15 ideas on them. Slowly, carefully, 
let them understand. Circumcision, as we'll see later, as we have seen, is of the heart. Verse 22. It pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who is also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. They wrote this letter by them. The apostles, elders, and the brethren to the brethren who are the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. That's quite a big area. Greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words unsettling your soul, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed too good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Paul and Barnabas, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to us, to, to the Holy Spirit and to us, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. It doesn't say show up at services every Sabbath. That was a given. You'll hear the law and the prophets and about Jesus Christ. That was a given. It didn't say abstain from these four things, but you know what? If you murder 14 people, that's okay. That's okay. If you curse your mother and father, another commandment, that's okay. No, that's not what they're saying. They're starting them out slowly, easily, so that they learn and understand. So a few issues to answer what we initially asked as questions. Is circumcision required? Absolutely. Sure is. Yes, circumcision of our heart. If you've got time, your ears, but not as the Pharisees understood it, not at all in any way, shape, or form. The answer is no. Are we to obey, follow, and understand God's law? God's law? Absolutely. Absolutely. Are parts of the law, the sacrifices and ceremonies especially, subsumed by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as high priest? Absolutely Yes. Do these parts that we observe save us? The ones that we observe, the commandments and the other laws that we observe, do they save us? Absolutely not. For it will, if it was by doing the law, if salvation rests on my imperfect record, maybe yours is better and I'm sure it is, but I know my own record. If it depends on that, I'm in trouble. If salvation rests on us doing the law correctly. I saw a great post recently. It said, quote, your flesh doesn't care where you spend eternity. It's not going with you. That's true. The flesh is the problem. So if we depend on the flesh to keep the law, we're in a whole world of hurt. But that doesn't mean we don't observe and obey. For new converts, do they need time to understand, to study, and just learn over time? Absolutely. I know I did. Uh, I would like to think you did. Some of the stuff is hard to grasp and they need time. Was there a break with Judaism and the law? Absolutely, with Judaism. Oral tradition, there was a break with that law. No to the written law. As Jesus and the apostles say over and over again in the New Testament. So let's conclude. This chapter tells us a few important facts. That Jesus' simple yoke of his teaching of the law of God is what gives us rest, both physically, like today, and mentally, emotionally. And again, there's so many examples. We are saved by grace, God's loving kindness that is expressed in both testaments throughout, through his son, Jesus Christ. It also tells us about how we should treat one another, especially those that are new around us. Because each of us learn at a different pace, but we all grow together. So give them time, especially the young, especially the new. Happy Sabbath.